sound speeds. And in my review of the Deity Connect 2.4 gigahertz wireless microphone system, I referred to it as the best in class wireless option available at the time. Now, since its release, there's been some new competitors on the market in the 2.4 gigahertz realm. But Deity responded to that by releasing the HDTX, cube style transmitter and recorder that not only works with lav mics, but with XLR mics too. Before we get going, full disclosure, Deity did send me the Connect interview kit in exchange for a fair review. I get to keep it following the review, but I'm not going to allow that to affect my opinion, so you can expect this to be a fair and honest review. Here's a very quick and incomplete recap from my first Deity Connect review. The Deity Connect is the only 2.4 gigahertz wireless system that transmits using up to 100 milliwatts of power on both the transmitter and the receiver meaning that the transmitter is not just a transmitter it's also a receiver and the receiver is not just a receiver it's also a transmitter now that allows you to make changes to the transmitter from the receiver while you're rolling so if you want to add a little bit of presence you can if you want to change the roll off frequency you can you want to change the in microphone input gain you can and that's just for starters. In my first highly recommended Deity Connect review, I went through the contents of the carrying case, how the Connect 2.4 gigahertz wireless system actually works, the menu structure, the battery life, the features, and even stress tested the BPTX. So I'm not gonna recap all of that now. Watch my Connect review for that. But what I will tell you is that there's been a few key changes. Firmware updates have given us a DSP, digital signal processing, to improve the quality while lowering the self noise. It's also given us two other latency options, medium 30 milliseconds and high 40 milliseconds to join the 19 millisecond low latency mode that the system was released with. Latency allows the Connect to repair lost data packets through retransmission. How? Well, the short of it is that if the receiver misses part of the transmission, it'll transmit back to the transmitter and request a resend of those missing data packets. I was skeptical about this when I first heard about it and my reason being is that if the transmitter and receiver are out of range now then in 19 milliseconds from now they're still going to be out of range now i don't want to assume so we're going to test it but first the case is the same or at least has the same build quality as the original connect system but for some reason it's a little bit more difficult to open on this connect system than it originally was I'd like to give you an idea i kind of have to use fingernails in order to get it open but once it's open you'll notice that the foam on the inside of the two body pack transmitter case is spongier you can press your fingers into that sponge which makes removing items from the case a lot easier the new sponge is denser and you can't push it in hardly at all so sometimes getting components out of it is a little bit more difficult Personally, I like the old foam better because it was easier to get things in and out of the case, but the new foam will likely last longer. Plus, there's a bit better space utilization at play with some items hidden underneath others. The big thing, though, is the HDTX transmitter and recorder for both LAVs and for boom microphones. And because it comes with its own little pleather carrying case that allows you to access both microphone inputs and see lights and pretty much access everything you want to except maybe the micro SD card slot, you're able to fully access everything you need to while keeping it inside the case. And that includes the menu and looking at the screen. The HDTX or handheld transmitter is made of both metal and plastic. The metal holds a good solid structure on the outside for the plastic bits to sit on. Now, the plastic bits on, on the side, for example, are hiding not just the ports, but also the antennas, which there are two of on either side. The plastic bit on the back does give a little bit to the touch as it does on the front as well. The buttons are the same clicky buttons that you run into on the BPTX and they function very similar too. Like for example, if you press the power button, it will mute whatever sound source you have going into it which is indicated by the little red light right there. The metal bits on the top are not enough to really weigh it down. So if you put this on the end of a boom pole, it's not gonna kill your boom operator. If you plug the HDTX into some sort of a handheld microphone and then press these buttons, most likely it will transfer that noise into the microphone capsule. But then so does moving your hand up and down the microphone if you don't have proper technique. If you use the case on this and you hold your hand steady, it shouldn't be much of an issue though. And as for changing the settings, do that from the receiver and there won't be any issue. If you've been watching my channel for a while, you know that I love to stress test and be careless with gear. At least I was with the BPTX, which is the little brother of the HDTX. But I'm not going to actually stress test the HDTX. I did ask Deity if I could, and it's as if they've watched my review in the past. They said I wouldn't throw it if I were you. And so I said, well, would it withstand some drops? And they said, we, it would probably do that, but you shouldn't do that. So I'm not going to. There's a USB-C charging port on the side next to a 1 8 inch 3.5 millimeter headphone jack. And there's also a micro SD card slot hidden behind a rubber cover. 
Insert a micro SD card and the HDTX is immediately ready to record. All you need to do now is screw a lav mic like the DDW Lab Pro into the locking TRS input or an XLR microphone into the XLR jack on top and you're ready to go. Note there is a screw lock built into the base of the XLR plug and if you screw it upwards counterclockwise towards the microphone, it'll lock in place even if the microphone is oversized at the port. To remove, you simply unscrew it clockwise all the way down and it should pull out even though mine sometimes sticks a little bit so I have to wiggle it to get it out. It should also be noted that the USB-C port on the side is for charging up the HDTX, not for plugging in a USB microphone. With the HDTX, you have either the option of running it in TRS mode if you want to plug a lav up to it, or in XLR mode if you want to plug it up to either a dynamic or a condenser microphone. And note, it does have 48 volt phantom power if you'd like to use it with a condenser, but obviously with a dynamic, you shouldn't use that. It should also be noted that on an unsearchable live stream that you can only find using that link right there, we discovered that the TRS input on the HDTX is only compatible with LAVs with a very shielded cable, like any of the W LAVs or even outside brands like the DPA. None of the other LAVs that I tested with it are compatible, they all buzzed, and that includes any other DPA LAV other than the 6060. It should also be noted that if you purchase a Connect Interview Kit in the United States, you will not have the ability to transmit and record on the HDTX at the same time. That feature is patented by Zaxcom and they're the only company allowed to use transmitting and recording simultaneously at the same time. That's not Deity. That is any company other than Zaxcom. But if you live outside the United States and you buy an interview kit, you will be able to transmit and record at the same time. And if you're already transmitting and you want to activate record, all you need to do is keep in mind that when you look at the screen, this is your channel one, this is your channel two. And if you want to record on channel one because it has the ability to record at the same time as transmit, you press and hold the up arrow for five seconds and you'll activate recording. And the same thing is true if you want to activate recording on channel two if you press the down arrow and hold it for five seconds. Now stop right now. I have to say something before we move on. I have heard other YouTube channels and influencers suggest that if you purchase an international version of the interview kit and bring it back to the United States that you'll be able to transmit and record on it at the same time. I'm going to suggest you do not do that under any circumstances, not just because it's illegal, but because Deity is extremely strict with regards to their policy regarding respecting Zaxcom's patent and use in the United States. And if they find out that an international sound vendor has sold an interview kit to come back and work in the United States, they're going to cease doing business with that international sound vendor. That's not fair to them, it's not fair to Deity, and it's not fair to Zaxcom. You may be able to transmit and record at the same time, but it's not worth it. And later in this video, I'm gonna show you that that technology won't even really be worth it to you if you do that. So to recap, only if you have the international firmware on both the receiver and the transmitter will you be able to remote roll at the same time. If you try with one US and one international firmware, it's not going to work. But all it takes is the international firmware on the HDTX in order to transmit and record at the same time if you want to manually start that feature up. Now let's talk about the recordings made by the HDTX for a moment. Whenever you hit record, it records a dual mono polyphonic broadcast WAV file. And if you bring that into your DAW, you're going to notice that inside of the same file, there are two audio recordings that are identical. Now, this is interesting to me because it could indicate that in the future at some point, DD is going to enable a safety track, allowing you to record either the TRS or XLR in the regular gain, but then on the second channel, it would be at negative 12 dB or negative 18, negative 20, something like that to assist with clipping. So that way you would always have a cleaner, lower gain setting at the same time recorded with the first. It also could mean that at some point they're going to enable the ability for you to record off of both of them simultaneously. Now, if neither one of those are part of their plans, then I would strongly suggest that DAD remove the second channel and allow it to only record a single mono channel. This would take the record time from eight hours on an eight gigabyte card up to 16 hours on the same eight gigabyte card. And this is 48K 24 bit audio we're talking about. Now here's something you might not have heard before. Where are the antennas on all of these units? Well, when you look at the BPTX, you're blind if you don't see this one right here. But there's also a second antenna right here between the 3.5 millimeter eighth inch and the SMA antenna port right there. So right in there, there is another antenna so it has two, just like the HDTX has. It has one on the inside right here and another on the other side opposite it. So this also has two, but the Duo RX has four. Obviously, you can see the two big ones on the front here. 
And those are the primaries, but there's also a secondary right here behind this plastic and another one right over there. So if there is a short on any of the external antennas, you're still going to have internal antennas to fall back on. But I do want to point out on the Duo RX, the left when you're looking at the screen is for the A antenna and the B antenna is right here. So if you only are going to be using one channel, then just plug in one antenna. That's fine. Now, here's something I really appreciate about the Connect Wireless system. The transmission may be digital, but the limiters are analog, and that to me is very much preferred. Audio that enters the transmitters is analog, and it's best to limit that before converting it to digital through the analog digital converters, because if you try to do it after the fact, it's already converted, distorted, and clipped audio. And it's much better to limit it before it goes through the conversion because the quality is gonna be better on the other end. At least that's my thought on it. So why don't we go ahead and test the limiters? I am now close micing a large diaphragm condenser microphone with low self noise and a high SPL rating. The HDTX is set to maximum input gain. That is plus 36 dB. If you are not aware, the limiter is in the off position. And I'm raising my voice louder and louder to see how well the HDTX records all of this distortion that's coming through without hitting any kind of limiter because they're all disabled. I'm now yelling into this microphone at full volume. I'm close miking a large diaphragm condenser microphone with low self noise and a high SPL rating, and the HDTX is set to maximum input gain, which is plus 36 dB if you are not aware. The limiter is set in the on position, and I'm slowly raising my voice louder and louder to test how well the limiter works on the HDTX as my voice increases in volume. Right now, I'm getting very, very loud, and this is first thing in the morning when I'm recording this, and my voice is about to get very, very hoarse because I'm yelling! Going into this microphone at full volume now. <coughs> 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 I think you'll agree with me that that was a worst case scenario for any limiter to have to deal with, but the Connect performed beautifully. Highly effective limiters, in my opinion. I was close micing a very sensitive microphone right here. And although the gain was all the way up on the HDTX, it was clipping when I was whispering. And by the time I got up to a complete scream and I was right here next to the microphone, it was still limiting it and pulling back the audio enough to make it usable under many circumstances. Now, granted, it's not going to be good as good as if you gain stage it correctly, but then I wasn't but it still seemed to do a pretty good job. So I call them very effective. The batteries on the inside of the connect transmitters and receivers are completely internal. So they'll last about 10 hours, but they'll take about an hour and a half to recharge. Now, as of the time of this video, Deity has not run into any circumstances where anyone has said, I need to get the batteries replaced in my transmitter or receiver. And when they do get that request, then they'll probably institute some sort of a exchange program. Or if you notice, there's not very many little bitty places to enter in on the Connect system. So Didi even said it's fairly easy to exchange. So who knows? They may in time say, go ahead, open it up and change it out yourself. Time will tell. Now let's test out the recordings made by the HDTX. But first, let me explain something. Sound waves as the recorded or rather sine waves go from a center line through a crest, then a trough. That's positive voltage, negative voltage. That's if it's in phase. If it's out of phase, it will go through a trough first, then a crest. Now, you know that. Let's move on. I find it very important to test the quality and the accuracy of the sound transmitted, received, and recorded. So here's what I did. I recorded through a large diaphragm condenser a voiceover. I put it into Reaper. I digitally removed the entire noise floor, normalized to zero dB, which I know you normally wouldn't do. And then I played it out of the same Sound Devices Mix Pre 6 on the same power source that I recorded it on into the HDTX, hardlined and transmitted. I did disable all limiters and roll-offs on the Mix Pre 6 and on the Connect system, so the transmitted or hardline sound for recording purposes should be as accurate as possible to the original, and not only that, it's going to be consistent every time. Now let's take a recording I made of the HDTX hardline to the output of the Mix Pre 6. I'll copy the file and then paste it underneath itself on the timeline so that now I have two files that are completely identical. Now once they're lined up, if I play them together, the volume increases. And if you want to know why, watch this video right there. Notice when I click the invert button, there is no sound coming out, although both channels are playing. That's because they are identical files exactly out of phase. The crests and troughs of the first file 
are completely negated by the troughs and crests of the second file. This is MixPre 6. I removed all of the noise floor digitally, and the next 10 seconds should be dead quiet to demonstrate this. If I discover a source of noise, I will put it in a graphic on the screen so that you'll know what I believe it is from. So here's what I did for our first test. I recorded the same voiceover out of the sound device's mix pre-6 twice through a hard line to the HDTX. I opened the recorded file on my DAW, I separated them, aligned them as perfectly as possible, and then flipped the phase on one of them. So they should, in theory, cancel each other out perfectly, but in the real world, that rarely happens. And the reason why is because they could be slightly different volumes. It could be the modulation differences if transmitted. It could also be slight timing differences in the 48K sampling or even quantization error. Regardless, we're hearing the differences between the two identical sine waves as closely as possible. If the sound is good but muted, it's likely because they aren't perfectly in phase in volume, modularity, sampling, quantization, etc. But anything aside from just a muted voice is a difference in the audio files. So let's now listen to both of these technically identical files that were recorded about 40 seconds apart and now are inverted to one another. This is a voiceover I recorded in my studio on a Sound Devices Mix Pre 6. I removed all of the noise floor digitally and the next 10 seconds should be dead quiet to demonstrate this. If I discover a source of noise, I will put it in a graphic on the screen so that you'll know what I believe it is from. It's transmitting to the Duo RX receiver and being recorded on the Zoom F8. That's my signal flow, and that's the conclusion of this test. Sounds fine, so let's move on. Now let's compare in the same way the recorded file on the HDTX to the raw file that I played back from the Sound Devices Mix Pre 6. This is a voiceover I recorded in my studio on a Sound Devices Mix Pre 6. I removed all of the noise floor digitally, and the next 10 seconds should be dead quiet to demonstrate this. If I discover a source of noise, I will put it in a graphic on the screen so that you'll know what I believe it is from. It's transmitting to the Duo RX receiver and being recorded on the Zoom F8. That's my signal flow, and that's the conclusion of this test. Although they are both 24-bit 48K audio files, the battery-powered HDTX records at a slightly different speed. You can see it when I got the beginning of the files in perfect sync and then zapped 30 seconds to the end, and you see that they are slightly drifted from one another. Because it drifts out of sync, it goes out of phase, and you can really hear that, especially when I jump to the end of the silence. Because the HDTX doesn't jam timecode, that drift could present an issue in post. And that right there is the reason why I said that Americans should not go through the trouble of trying to get themselves an international version of the interview kit, because the transmitted sound and the recorded sound are going to be slightly out of sync with each other, and I don't know how valuable that's going to be to post. And it's definitely not worth destroying the relationship between an international professional sound vendor and deity just for something that Post might not even be able to use. With exception of the audio drift time issue that I mentioned, I think that the recordings made by the HTTX are very good quality. They're a very close match, especially at this price point. But I do want to add that if you're going to be using the HTTX for something like a YouTube video, you can synchronize them very easily by clapping at the beginning and end of your recording, and then simply synchronize up the claps at the beginning and time stretch the audio to match it accordingly. Doing that, you're going to be able to save your audio. So now, why don't we test out the preamps on the HGTX's XLR input by testing it with one of the most gain-hungry microphones in existence, the Shure SM7B. I'm speaking a little bit louder than normal directly into my very gain-hungry SM7B. I'm going to go quiet now and let you hear the noise floor. I'm now going to disconnect my SM7B from the recorder while it's recording, and I can't wait to hear how this sounds in post. The self noise is insanely high and it's drowning out my voice in fact, so I imported the file into Reaper and applied a very simple and fairly inexpensive noise removal plugin called the Waves NS1. I have to use it really aggressively to knock down the self noise to a decent level, but it pulls the quality of my voice down quite a bit with it. I'm speaking a little bit louder than normal directly into my very gain hungry SM7B. I'm going to go quiet now and let you hear the noise floor.
I'm now going to disconnect my SM7B from the recorder while it's recording, and I can't wait to hear how this sounds in post. When recording with a low noise condenser microphone, you don't have to have the gain up nearly as high. So this time, unlike the SM7B, the Neat Microphone's King B is not a dynamic microphone, it's a condenser. So when I go quiet this time, you should be able to hear my noise floor. Yes, that was indeed my clothes dryer you were listening to, and I was doing that for a reason. Bet you didn't even notice it on the noise floor test for the SM7B, did you? The self-noise level is much better, so the preamps are fine at lower levels, but if you gain it up too much, then it gets really noisy. If you are planning on using a dynamic microphone and recording on the HDTX, then you might consider looking into something like a cloud lifter, a fed head, an SE Electronics Dynamite, something like that to amplify the signal, so that way you don't have to have the gain nearly as high on the HDTX. That'll give you a cleaner recording. So if you're curious as to how the noise floor measures, well, the 0 dB very loud normalized file when hardlined and recorded on the HDTX gave us a negative 74 db noise floor which is extremely good all things considered now when i transmitted through the hdtx and recorded it i got a negative 70 db which is 40 db higher but considering it was transmitted that's very very good so my overall impressions are that the sound quality is really good the noise floor is low whether recording sound or transmitting sound the limiters are really good the only real concern i have is the audio drift over time but then, as long as you're aware of that and you know how to get around that, shouldn't be an issue. But why don't we test out something else now? First and foremost, the Connect Interview Kit is a wireless system. So why don't we test out the range on low, medium, and high latency? This was a busy street with light Wi-Fi activity. So why don't we cut to the chase and get to the meat and potatoes of the test and give you the results. And at this time, I'm probably about 200 feet or so away from the receiver. And as I start to go farther and farther away, we'll see how it reacts. Right now, the transmitters are in low latency mode. They're talking to the receiver. The transmitters are also separated on the roof side of the hill thing because now line of sight and quickly approaching the receiver. So in about 200 more feet, I'll be all the way back and we will be good to go with this test. Hopefully this 19 milliseconds has proven to be good with the transmitters that far apart. I'm now in medium latency mode and leaving the road, uh, leaving the parking lot that I was in, driving up to about 50 miles an hour. Letting these cars pass me is gonna be pretty awesome because uh, it's gonna tell how the range is. Now, according to the way it's been so far, as soon as I go into this little dip right here where I'm about to enter, then my signal seems to drop a little bit, but then it comes as I get over the hill, order and everything is. So at this point, I'm about 200 feet away, rapidly approaching 100 feet, and about to pull into the parking lot at about 50 feet right now. I'm now in high latency mode on the transmitters. That means there's about a 40 millisecond delay, and as I pull onto the interstate, or I guess this is an interstate, this is more of a uh, just a busy Georgia road here. We'll see how the latency works and if it actually does uh, help us quite a bit with regards to our transmission range. I'm getting close to the range because I'm only about seven or so hundred feet away from the receiver. And at this time, it's probably closer to 300 feet because I'm going about 50 miles an hour down this road making my turn in in front of the camera and it shouldn't be more than about 50 feet at this time so there we go with our range tests as expected the higher the latency was the more range i had now the biggest issue i ran into was vehicles coming between my transmitters and receivers but then that's to be expected too with 2.4 gigahertz but what about in a high rf area we're now in a very busy mall and I'm not supposed to be shooting here, but we're going to anyway. I have one transmitter right here on this side, and I have the other transmitter on the other side. So it's on either side of my body, and both lobs are right here inside of my hat. I'm gonna take a walk now. And I did scan the air just before recording this. It is heavy RF in this area. So we're gonna see in an environment with a lot of Wi-Fi how these transmitters work. I'm walking away right now. We're gonna see how well this range holds up. At this point, I'm about 50 feet or so away, going down the escalator. So I'm now out of line of sight, heading towards the carousel. I'm gonna take a little walk down here. Heading down towards this little cookie shop. And at this point, there's quite a bit of metal between where I'm going. 
and walking around into the food court area. Approaching lunchtime, so I'm expecting someone to come out here and offer me free Chinese samples or something. We'll see what happens. Coming out into the visible area, walking around now, at this point, you're probably getting the BPTX better than you're getting the HDTX because it's, the HDTX is actually going through my body while the BPTX is right here facing the camera. And if I back up over here, I don't know if you can still catch me or not because I'm not monitoring the sound. Surprisingly enough, we're getting pretty good range here. Now keep in mind that this is in high latency mode. So because of that, we're getting, you know, probably a best case scenario with regards to the Connect Lav system. And if we are getting pretty solid signal here, I might go outside just to see what happens. Exiting the mall. Second door. Music out here. If you call the pretty good point to be expected because this is there's a lot of interference here. People in this food court probably have a whole bunch of Bluetooth on their phones turned on. Not to mention the fact that there's a lot of Wi-Fi hotspots in the air and area because this is a mall. So I don't know if you were able to catch all of that, but we will see. That bag right there contains my recorder and the Deity Connect receiver, the Duo RX. And I'm about to take a walk over here, headed towards that Macy's behind me, but currently I am making my way towards this great American cookie. There is some pillars in the way and hopefully we're firing through those pretty well. There's a lot of Wi-Fi interference in this area, a whole lot of Wi-Fi routers, I guess, set up here in this mall. And I'm quickly approaching the front of the Macy's, even as we speak. And at this point, I would say it's probably a good, oh geez, where am I? Maybe about 150 feet, close to 200, as I'm entering in the mall area right now. The uh, Macy's area, I should say. Walking away from where you are right now, passing by this little Tiffany and Company display, heading toward this escalator, and we will see at what point transmitters no longer punch through all this. Now it's heavy in the area, expecting it to last. Company, 50 feet from the entrance, these right now, rapidly approaching 30 feet, and we're getting close to 20. In, and I'm now exiting the Macy's even as we speak, headed across the mall towards where you are at this time. We'll see at what point you're able to hear me. Now, I know there's a lot of stuff going on between us, and I know this is not the least bit entertaining for you, but if you could hear me pretty well for a distance, that's a, a good test. Don't know how well it's going to hold up, but we will see in the edit at what point it cut off. I definitely think you want to try to keep your receivers as close to your talent transmitters as possible. But then that goes without saying on any wireless system, doesn't it? Now, I think that line of sight in this heavy RF Wi-Fi environment, I think it did pretty well. Now, the big issue I ran into was any time I did not have line of sight to the receivers. That's when I went through the floor. That's when I crossed a pillar. That's when I went on the other side of glass, like when I went outside and on the other side of a brick wall. When I did that and I broke that line of sight, that's when we ran into issues. Now, I do want to point out that when I went outside, I was on the other side of the opening and closing automatic door radar. So I don't know if that interfered with it or not. Who knows? Well, what I will say, though, is I was pretty impressed by the results despite the heavy Wi-Fi, but definitely try to keep yourself line of sight to your transmitters. So in my testing of this heavy Wi-Fi area, I had range of up to about 225 feet, provided I was line of sight. It did fall off a little bit when there was anything between, but we've kind of discussed that already. But what about if there's no Wi-Fi in the air? How well does it punch through walls then? This is what always happens whenever you shoot a video someone decides to come up and start using the same area. Now, we're not paying for this area, obviously. He doesn't bother me. As a matter of fact, I find it kind of amusing that a bus full of kids just pulled up on the other side of the camera as soon as they hit roll. And he is now skateboarding around the exact area we've been talking about shooting in and gone around and kind of been setting up in the past hour. It's just the way things are. What I'm doing here 
is I have the HDTX in my left hand. I have the BPTX in my right hand. I'm gonna be keeping them a little bit separate, trying to manage my cables a little bit. If you notice way over there on the left side of frame, Barry is standing there with my receiver and my recorder. So these are transmitting to him. Now we're in low latency mode on the D80 Connect system right now. And what I'm gonna to try to do is if you look at the building behind me, it's all entirely made of brick. On the left hand side, right in front of Barry, there is indeed a metal door. So as I walk around, I'm gonna walk around in this middle gap here where the skateboarder is back there right now. And I'm gonna see if it can fire, if, if the transmitter and the receivers can fire through all of that brick. And then if they do successfully do that, I'm gonna to go to the other side and see if they can transmit all the way through to the other side of the brick. So that's two layers of brick and probably amounting to maybe 70 feet. I'll go and do an overhead shot and measure it via Google Earth and tell you exactly how much that is on the screen. But for right now, that's basically what I'm looking at test wise. I know you can't see from where you are right now, but the HDTX is about two feet to the right of the BPTX, but they're directly in line with each other to the receiver. I'm currently just a coming across the brick of the building between me. As I continue to walk through, there's a lot of brick. I'm now passing a metal door, brick, metal door again, brick, metal door again. So if you experience any kind of dropouts, that would be why those things happen. We're again in low latency mode right now. And I'm gonna step over to the left-hand side and test high latency mode and medium and see what happens there. I'm on the far side of the building right now, still in low latency mode, and I'm just now passing ac across the same brick that we just traveled across before. And now I'm passing over a second layer of brick. And now through metal cages, like a, a, there's a fence here on the back, now I'm going through a whole bunch of brick on this building. And as I pass this area, I'm now on the other side of a metal door. And the skateboarder is giving you something more entertaining to look at than me and I'm going through this entire brick building. There's metal doors and everything over there. And as I come around this side of the building, I'm still not line of sight to my uh, receivers over there with Barry monitoring them, but I am definitely now free and out and open in the air. So that was low latency mode. This is medium latency mode. This is 30 milliseconds of delay where it's gonna be using some of the delay to try to repair any audio dropouts. Passing on the other side of the brick building, more layers of brick, the metal door, the brick, second metal door, the brick, metal door, and we're coming around the front side of the building at this point. So you should be able to hear me fairly clearly, hopefully at this point, through only one corner of the building. I will see though when I get into post, and I'm sure you were listening. I'm now line of sight to the receivers, and I'm going through now one layer of brick, and now I'm entering the second layer of brick. Chain link fins between me again, and now a whole bunch of brick is between me and the brick walls and the metal doors and all that kind of good stuff. So if you're still hearing me, great. We're on the other side of a lot of brick. Now there is no Wi-Fi hotspots in this area. I did scan earlier and didn't find anything. So at least that's working to our advantage. But if you're in an area with a lot of Wi-Fi, it may not work nearly as effective as this. Now we're in high latency mode. That's 40 milliseconds of delay. This equivalates to just over one frame of video if you're shooting 30 FPS. Now in 30 millisecond mode, which was medium, the test that we just got through doing, that would only be just about three and a third milliseconds over one frame. Bunch of geek talk, but at least that gives you an idea of what we're looking at as we go through the walls here. This high delay, the, the uh, maximum latency, this is supposed to repair the sound the best. So we'll see what that does with regards to firing through walls. Now I'm on the far side of the building and we're line of sight now, but just entering in behind the wall. And we're now going behind the chain link fence with the HDTX and the BPTX traveling through all maximum brickage over here at this point, going through a metal door and we're going through more brick. There's now an airplane coming overhead too, just in case all the kids in the skateboarder and everything else isn't enough. Now we have some uh, airplane traffic too. Coming around the front of the building now though, I'm still not line of sight to the receiver and I'm not gonna be in this test, but that concludes our range test over here through this brick building. Now, as you look at the building, I'm way over here on the right hand side, holding the transmitters up over the other side of the chain link fence. The reason I'm doing this is because Barry said that I didn't really have very many dropouts, if any at all, 
in the high latency test. So now I'm on the other side of this chain link fence and as I drop the transmitters down, we'll see if this acts as a Faraday cage. Now, right now I'm through one layer of fence, entering in the second layer of fence even as we speak. And at this point, I'm pretty much firing through the entire building and two layers of chain link fence with both transmitters directly in the line of everything directly to Barry. So if you can still hear me with pretty good you know, quality, then that's a really good thing because uh, at this point, there's a lot that this thing is firing through. Now granted, there's no Wi-Fi in the area. If there was, it would be affecting the sound too, but at this point, I'm very curious to see what this sounds like. This test really impressed me because each side of the building was completely walled around in brick. It had multiple metal doors and on the inside of each, there was also bathrooms I was firing through. And each one of those, as you know, has little thin individual metal walls. So despite that, I was able to travel through on high latency, all three to the outside of two entire brick buildings. That to me was very impressive. And even then on high latency, I was able to go through two additional fences chain link fences. So who knows how much I was transmitting through. Now, keep in mind, this was in a no RF, no Wi-Fi RF kind of environment. So I didn't have any competition there, but even then it was able to punch through quite a bit using the standard connect interview kit. That to me, I thought was pretty impressive, especially for 130 feet. At this time, I was starting to wonder if I had interference between the two transmitters because they were too close, for example. So I decided to test and see if they would interfere with each other if they were too close. Now we're shooting outside of the lake. And if you look across the lake out there, you see Barry is with the recorder and the receivers in front of that sun statue. Now me, I'm on this side of the lake with the two transmitters. We're still in high latency mode, but as I start to bring my arms in closer and closer, we're gonna see if we start running into any kind of an RF modulation issues with these transmitters getting too close. When I did the outside range test with the driving involved, we started to run into issues when our microphones or when our transmitters rather were stacked on top of each other. So now I'm about two feet apart and we're about to enter inside of my body, firing through my body over there to where Barry is right now. So they're now going to be shooting through my body and we'll see how this, how this works. And at this point, as you can look at and see on the screen, they're practically on top of each other and still firing through my body. So if you're still hearing me just fine right now, then there's no real modulation issues you need to worry about too much. And this is the nature of this test. We'll see what happens. Firing through my body, across a lake, to the receiver, if any affecting the way that the RF sounds. You can see what I'm doing here on camera and uh, hearing every bit of it as well. After the previous test, I talked to my sound engineer and he told me that when I brought the BPTX between my body and the receiver, it cut out. Well, I have decided to redo the test, but this time I'm not going to bring them between my body and the receivers. This time they're about three feet apart at this time. I'm bringing them closer to two feet apart. We're going to see if there's any modulation issues. Now it's not going to be firing through my body. It is line of sight directly to the receivers. Bringing them closer together, they're only about a foot or so apart at this time. Now I'm trying to, to keep the two antennas that are on the inside of the HDTX right there completely open. Or actually, I think there's only one in the HDTX. I'll have to double check that. I'll correct myself on the screen right now if I was wrong, but I'm gonna bring them even closer, closer together. They're about three inches apart and we're now crossing it. Now, the HDTX has internal antennas and the BPTX has an antenna on top. So I'm going to block the external antenna on the BPTX with the uh, HDTX. All this nomenclature is starting to really get difficult to keep in mind. Now I'm gonna reverse this and put the BPTX in front of the HDTX. And we're firing through that now. I'm going to see if that's any issues. I'm going to try to get my hands out of the way there. One more time, bringing it around and blocking the antenna on the BPTX with the HDTX. And here they are side by side. I'm going to see how well this does when I get back to the studio. Neither transmitter really seemed affected by the other one, even when they were right next to each other and even blocking one another. And that's at 450 feet, and that's a good thing. Now, really, it was only when I broke line of sight and put the transmitter between my body and the receiver that we ran into any kind of an issue at all. Now, I did realize an error that I made in this test after the fact, and I'm going to go ahead and confess it now. Both the BPTX and the HGTX were put into 100 milliwatts transmission mode for this test. 
they were in high latency mode, which is controlled by the receiver. But the BPTX receiver was in 10 milliwatt transmission mode. And here's why that was an issue. When I did my original DAD Connect test, I came to realize that if the receiver is out of range or shuts off altogether from the transmitter, the transmitter goes into a low power mode and ceases transmission. So when I was in 10 milliwatt mode on the receiver, the transmitter might have said, well, I'm not getting any feedback from the receiver. I'm going to go ahead and shut myself off. We saw the BPTX do that in one of the tests as soon as I crossed my body with it. So it was probably not repairing sound like it expected to and was maybe freaking out and saying, well, there's nothing for me to transmit to. I'm going to go ahead and shut down. I don't like that mode at all. So I have reached out to Deity and requested that they give us an option to have the transmitters transmit regardless of whether or not they're receiving feedback from the receiver. That way, if there's a 10 milliwatt, 100 milliwatt transmission issue and the receiver is just not seeing the transmitter or vice versa, they're not going to just stop transmitting altogether. And on that note, Deity, please give us an auto mode on the Duo RX. You got it on the transmitters, but not on the Duo RX receiver. For my next series of tests, I decided to hardline out from the sound devices mix pre-6 into the BPTX transmitter. Transmit about 50 feet through the air into the Duo RX receiver and then record on the Zoom F8. By doing this, I was going to guarantee that the sound was going to be pristine, full fidelity, and low noise. And that's going to give us pretty good results. These tests will tell us a lot about the quality of audio being transmitted and received. Just look at my sound report and you'll see how many things we tested. And I'll be honest with you, it was pretty boring and time consuming, so I'll spare you a lot of that. But here were the results. With the Zoom F8 and the Connect Duo RX receiver set at the same fixed gain level for all tests, we adjusted the input level of the BPTX and recorded a series of tests one increment in gain off every single time. And by doing so, bringing it into post, bringing all of them up normalized to the same exact level, and then listening to the noise floor, we were able to hear what level the BPTX transmitted at and gave us the best noise floor. We found that the lower the input level was, the more noise you would have in post when you brought it back up. Now, that was a good find because it basically goes to show that as long as you gain stage your transmitter correctly, then you shouldn't have a problem with level because it will be set at its optimal level for performance and self-noise. Now, that was if we adjusted the level on the BPTX. But what about if we adjusted the level on the Duo RX and just like with this test, reversed it so that that way the Duo RX changes in one-step increments while the BPTX is at a fixed level? Let's try that. The results this time were quite different. I'm going to show you on the computer exactly what I'm talking about. When normalized and level matched this time, we found that the output level not only affected the self noise, but also the sound itself. The self noise was lowest when the Duo RX was set to 0 dB or even plus 3 dB. But the higher the output level raised, the bass decreased while the high started to drop off. I found a good compromise between the self noise and frequency response was 0 dB. It was the lowest audible level self noise before the high started to fall off fast. The reason why is remember the lower it is, the more flat the frequency response is. So I'm going to prefer a flatter response to more of a sloped one any day. We've done multiple tests on the latency so far, but how does it affect the quality of the sound? Well, to test this, I recorded three audio samples with the same exact level across all components. And then I changed it from low to medium to high when I did a playback from each one of those samples. I brought them into Reaper. I normalized everything to zero dB. Woohoo! And then I phased aligned everything and then sampling only two of them at a time, I inverted the phase on one. So by comparing two at a time, I'm able to see how the quality changes. Because remember that whole cancellation thing. Let's see how this turned out. 
I grabbed a short segment and listened to it over and over again, flipping and comparing latencies and found something very interesting. There's a noticeable scratchy sound over the F and S sounds, but the higher the latency was, the more present it was. When I compare low medium latency to medium and high latency modes, the low medium is slightly more open and detailed than the medium high was. When comparing low to high latency, there's a definite clash and the resulting sound is much less detailed and that scratch is very noticeable. Put it in a graphic on the screens. 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 Put it in a graphic on the screens put it in a graphic on the screens put it in a graphic on the screens the best results occurred when i canceled the low and medium together followed by the medium and high leaving the low and high as lacking the most in clarity the overall conclusion that i draw from this is that the higher the latency the better we'll be able to punch through walls but at the sacrifice of a little bit of sound quality that you might not even notice so this is to say that if you can operate in lower latency modes you're going to get a more open detailed and clear sound and the higher the latency goes, it's going to start to introduce more sibilance and scratch to it. Now, that's going to be present in the lower latency modes too, but it's much more noticeable in the higher latency modes. So what do I think of the Connect Interview Kit? Well, at $699, it's $30 more than the kit that contains two of these little bad boys in it, but you get a lot more functionality out of this. Now, sure, it's going to be bigger and bulkier if you try to hide this on your talent as a wireless pack, but then that's not really its purpose now, is it? It's designed for more handheld mic use or to turn a boom into a wireless boom. And because it has the ability to record on a micro SD card up to 128 gigs in capacity, that's huge. You could buy an HDTX by itself for $250, and then you can simply switch it out with one of your BPTXs on your current Connect system whenever you'd like to. And you can easily swap them back and forth because it's a simple pairing process and it works very effectively. I did not show my testing in this video, but the BPTX and the HDTS both function very similarly, giving me about 10 hours of battery power when I was going TRS on the HDTX. Now, when I went XLR in with phantom power on, I went down to about 9 hours and 45 minutes, but when I turned phantom power off and ran the same test, it gave me about 10 hours and 10 minutes. So phantom power changes very little, but you're still going to get a good 9 hours and 45 minutes plus out of your battery life. With regards to the charging time on the HDTX, it took between about 137 and 139 minutes every time I tried charging it, and that's going from dead all the way up to full. So here's what I will say with regards to the HDTX and the overall package that you get with the interview kit. If you don't know my opinion by now, then use the timestamps below and jump around to the segments that you're curious about and listen to my opinion at the end of each segment. I was very detailed and it would be too much to recap now. I still do believe that the Deity Connect is the best in class 2.4 gigahertz wireless option available on the market today to prosumers and entry level professionals. The reason I say that is because you get a lot for your $700. You get two transmitters, two receivers, a whole bunch of accessories, a whole bunch of features, a carrying case, and it just keeps going. There are other competitors in the 2.4 gigahertz wireless market today, but considering the features that you get for the Connect, it's well worth the investment, especially if you need to remote control a lot of features like gain or putting something to sleep and try to milk that battery life. Plus you get more battery power than those other options. So you're going to spend a little bit more, but you're going to get more for your money. All in all, I think the HDTX is a great addition to the Connect Wireless family. I've had a lot of fun testing it. It seems very versatile in its feature set. It sounds good. The quality is spot on. And if I were to say that there was a couple of things I'd like changed, I would like to see the preamps better, especially with regards to dynamic microphones. That way we could use it for something like a Voice of God system. And also with regards to the recording, I would love to see it stay in sync with any kind of a wireless system that's connected to. So that way that track could be used in post without having to stretch it or anything. With regards to the overall Overall connect system as a whole, I love it. I love the menus, I love the features, I love the accessories, I love the way it's all laid out. But there's a couple of things I would like to see changed. The slight scratchy sound behind the F and S sounds. If that could clear up, I think that the audio quality would be pretty much untouched until you go into the thousand dollar transmitter and receiver market. Now, a couple of other things though. I would love to see an auto mode on the Duo RX, and I would love to see the transmitter have the ability to transmit even if it loses signal to the Duo RX. And I'm sure you know that if you watch my review of all the Connect Lobs on the market, you'll know that I hate the Connect Lob that it comes with. This little thing does not do it justice. The sound quality is so much better than this allows it to be. So get rid of it. Now here's one last thing I'm gonna say, not just to Deity, but also 
to Zaxcom. Now, Zaxcom, you don't need my opinion at all. You're doing great on your own. But here's what I will point out. Zaxcom is extremely top tier, high end professional wireless. Deity is entry level professional wireless and prosumer. But the features are very similar. But the way that they go about are different. But the end user doesn't necessarily care about that. But if Zaxcom's patent for transmitting and recording simultaneously could be somehow licensed to Deity. I think that the people that are buying into the entry-level professional wireless realm right now with Deity are going to be addicted to that feature set and addicted to that workflow. And they're gonna be used to that. So when they're ready to upgrade to professional wireless, there's only one other company on the market that's able to do it all. Zaxcom. I think that would be a good business decision for both companies. So there you have it. Extensive testing of the Connect interview kit. Thank you for tuning into this episode of Soundspeeds. Be sure to tune in the future for more extensive testing that takes forever for me to do and sound advice. Have a question you'd like answered or want to add something? Be sure to write it in the comment section down below. You can also make a suggestion for future topics of discussion. Again, comment section down below or you can email me at soundspeeds at yahoo.com. Be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications so you won't miss out on future sound advice.